God saved me in the early months of 1984. I was a 19-year-old sinner who was born into a religious home. My parents had me baptized as an infant. I took my first communion. I went to every mass I was supposed to go to, every service I was supposed to go to. I got confirmed. But when I left home after high school, I knew that something was missing. I knew that nothing really seemed real to me spiritually. I knew how to go through the motions. I knew how to do what I was told to do. But there wasn't anything real going on inside of me. On top of that, my conscience was very troubled by sin. Sinful choices I had made toward the end of high school and into early college. And my conscience was very disturbed by these things. I tried to fill that hole. I tried to take care of the guilt in many different ways. I tried self-hypnosis at one time. I remember going to an overnight retreat where I was supposed to find myself. That was the promise of the retreat. Come to this retreat and you will find yourself. And I didn't find myself. But God was using that and all of those questions and longings as he was working in my heart to bring me to a point where he found me. And so he led me into a Bible study in the Gospel of John. And and there the Holy Spirit began to open my eyes to who I really am, a sinner who cannot save himself no matter how religious I can possibly be. And he showed me who Jesus is that he is the one and only Savior, that he is creator, he is Lord. He made me, and he came to save me. That he is the only Savior who died in my place as the sacrifice for my sin. He rose to give me new life, and when on that cross he said, it is finished, he meant it. That he had done all of the work required to purchase my salvation. There was nothing that I could do to add to it. And no longer did I need to be in bondage to my sin or even to my works-based religion. I discovered that there was freedom in Christ. And so later in the privacy of my bedroom at the group home where I lived and worked, I cried out to God to save me. More than once, I think several times, I was just responding to his work in my heart. In the months that followed, I noticed things were changing inside of me. My thinking was changing. I began to have a hunger for the Bible that I had never had in my whole life. God saved me. He was doing a work. My desires were changing. I wanted to know Christ. I wanted to follow Christ. And what God did for me is he pulled me out of religion and brought me into a living relationship with him, whereby I knew Christ as my Savior, as my Lord, And in the months that followed, I was intentionally discipled by the church that brought me this good news of Christ and brought into a basic discipleship uh, strategy that lasted 18 months. And during that time, I learned something called the bridge illustration, which was a simple visual for understanding how God has done everything for us through Christ to bridge the gap, the bottomless chasm between us and him, the chasm caused by our sin. And that visual of my rescue by God was locked into my brain and knit into my heart. And it's an illustration I've turned to many times over the years to reflect 
on the simplicity of the gospel, but also just to reflect on the amazing love of God to do this for sinners like you and me. And so it is the basis of this six-part series that I've called The Bridge to Eternal Life. And just by way of review, let me remind you that the bridge to eternal life begins with God. And uh, God is holy and God is loving. And so God is on one side of the chasm and we are on the other side. The chasm is caused by our sin in following Adam and Eve, not only in, in inheriting original sin, but in following them in choosing to sin, we have caused this break between us and God. And God is holy. He is unique. He is set apart. And as the Holy One, He must judge sin. But He is also loving. He saw us in our helpless state. He saw us in our sinful state as His enemies. And He chose to make a way the way, the one and only way to him. But we try so hard to bridge this gap ourselves. Every man-made religion on the planet is an example of this. We, we try to work our way to God. Sometimes we try to buy our way to God. We, we try to be a good person. We know because of our guilty conscience that we are not innately good. And so we try to deal with that problem. And either we deal with it by honestly facing it and coming to Christ, or we spend our whole lifetimes working our fool heads off, running here and there and everywhere, and going to every possible retreat and service and seminar and conference, trying to find the way can't find the way. Sometimes we use religion and religious rituals like infant baptism and communion and confirmation. You can add that to a never-ending list of the things that man invents in order to try to get to God. But it's futile. God's word is very clear that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done that we can be saved, but it's only according to his mercy, and that mercy is found in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who has bridged the gap between us and God. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the man, Christ Jesus. And as such, we need to understand who he is. He is both Lord and he is Savior. He is the Lord. He is the creator. He is the one who has rightful authority over our lives. He's also the Savior. The one who came and paid the price for our sin. He made himself an offering, the one and only acceptable offering for our sins and offered it on the cross. He was punished in our place. The wrath of God was poured out upon him. He said, it is finished. And when he gave up his spirit, there was a great earthquake, not only in the earth itself, but there was a massive split in the temple, and the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom, shouting to the world, shouting to sinners like you and like me, we can now come to God through him. And so this is our invitation from God to come to Jesus, who then bridges the gap for us and he is the only way to the Father. Well, this morning <clears throat> we want to think about what our response must be. In other words, how do we get from this side to this side? How do we get from our sinful, helpless state into a relationship with God? Well, the Bible says this comes to us by faith. And faith is a two-sided coin. On one side of the coin, it says repent. And on the other side of the coin, it says believe. So let's think about what that means for us today. Open again to the book of Romans, which is where we have been for the last four weeks. 
and we continue to be. And I've chosen just to stay in Romans, even though I could have gone in so many different locations for each of these points, because I want you to understand how this emerges from the greatest letter written by the Apostle Paul and the greatest treatise on the theology of salvation, the book of Romans. Someday, if God gives me life to do it, I want to preach through this incredible book right now it still really intimidates me <laughs> and, uh, but it's it's breathtaking in its scope of god's work for us in salvation so let's begin by thinking about uh, what does it mean to repent uh, well repent means to turn essentially that's what the word means it is a 180 it's a 180 degree turn away from self to Christ. And so when we repent, we turn away from ourself and we turn to Christ. It's only logical, right, that if we turn away from something, we are also turning toward something else. And so when it comes to saving faith, we are turning away from unbelief, we are turning away from sin, and we are turning to the Savior. And so that's why repent and believe are, are so often woven together in so many texts of Scripture. And we'll just look at a, a few of them this morning. But it means to turn, to make a 180 away from yourself to Christ. And this is really important for us to understand because in, in too many modern-day presentations of the gospel, Jesus is, pre is presented as someone you add to your life. Just come to Jesus. Accept him as your savior. You don't have to change anything in your life. Just, just put the, the ticket in your back pocket. The get out of hell free card. But that's really not a proper understanding of all that Jesus is. Jesus is not only Savior, but he's also Lord. And so when we come to him for salvation, there's also a humility and a brokenness of heart that, that brings us to him in the first place. And of course, that looks different for each of us as far as levels of understanding. We can come to God with the childlike faith that understands the guilty conscience is working in us because God wants it to work in us, and we see ourselves as a sinner, and we see Jesus as the glorious Savior, and in uh, childlike faith, whether we are uh, an elementary age child or we are a full-grown adult that's been walking and living in rebellion for decades, we come to Jesus with this understanding that we are broken sinners who cannot save ourselves, and there is only one who can save us. We don't add Jesus to our lives. That's not salvation. We turn away from self to Christ. And praise God that this is a work of the Holy Spirit. The Bible presents repentance and faith as works of God. In other words, it's what God is doing in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God. It's not just one thing we add to the list of the things that we've already been trying to do. Make sense? All right, well, let's think about repentance a little bit more deeply. First, notice that repent means that we turn away from faith in our goodness or our family religion. Let's start in Romans chapter 2. The context here is that Paul, in the first three chapters of Romans, is arguing that every one of us, no matter our upbringing, is equally guilty before God as a sinner. We have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet the religious man, the moral man, wants to argue with that conclusion. And so Paul raises this uh, hypothetical man in chapter 2, where he says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges... For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man? Okay, so he's saying, 
moral man, religious man who judges other people because you don't do the things that they do and you think that you are self-righteous and you are more righteous than other people because of that? Or do you suppose, O man, that you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you think, O moral man, do you think, O religious person, that you are going to escape the judgment of God because of your religion? Or do you suppose, or do you presume, verse 4, on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And he then identifies later on in the chapter who this, this man is, O oh man, in verse 1. He says in verse 17, But you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boasts in God. And so as a Jew, Paul is writing, uh, and he understands the mind of the Jewish person who is counting on their religion because that was his past before he came to a state of brokenness before Christ. And so he, he is saying to this moral man, do you not understand that it is only God's kindness and forbearance and patience that leads any sinner to repentance? It is not your morality. It is not your family heritage. It is not that you were born into the Jewish faith, he's saying to this man. And we can fill in the blank for any one of us. It's not because we were born into a certain religion. And those of you even who were, who were given the gift of being raised by, by Bible-believing parents who, who understand the gospel and, and you were exposed at an early age, even you, as privileged as you are, you cannot be saved through your parents' faith. It is It is impossible. And so when we repent, we, we turn away from faith in our own goodness or family religion. And that's what he's saying to this man. You are not good. You are included. Even though you sit there and judge on your high horse everybody else because you're the religious person, you actually are just as guilty as they are. In fact, because of your hard heart, verse 5, your hard and impenitent heart. In other words, your heart that refuses to repent. To be honest with God, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So to, to turn a 180, to make a 180 degree turn to Christ involves turning away from faith in your goodness or family religion. He says this again in chapter 3, in verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin, as it is written. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. And we already walked through that passage a few weeks ago. But again, the whole point here is Paul is saying to this man who is counting on his family heritage, counting on his family religion, counting on his own goodness to, to be saved, he's saying, you're wrong. And proof of it is your hard heart. Proof of it is your self-righteous mind that causes you to refuse to repent. Secondly, it means to turn away from faith in your works of righteousness to Christ, the righteousness of God. To repent in this way means that you are under, you're coming to Jesus as Savior, recognizing that you've tried and tried and tried, and you cannot overcome sin. You cannot change your heart, and only God can. You cannot bring to God a righteousness that is acceptable to him. Instead, you must receive righteousness from Jesus. And you're coming to Jesus to save you. Look at chapter 3 and verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. 
since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness of it. So the law and the prophets bear witness of God's righteousness, but the greatest demonstration of the righteousness of God is the cross of Jesus Christ, because at the cross, our sin was paid for, which pleased and appeased the righteous God. And so now righteousness comes to us, how? Verse 22, through faith. The righteousness of God comes to us through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift. And so when we repent, we turn away from our works of righteousness, recognizing that they have no merit before God. They will never be righteous enough. And we understand that Jesus alone can save us. And what that then means for us is as we grow in our understanding of the gospel, is it means then that at the moment that we were saved, God took our sin, put it on Christ. Christ gave us his righteousness. Now that took place historically on the cross. It's the double imputation that took place on the cross where man's sin was imputed to Jesus, judged as if he had committed all those sins, and then Jesus gives us his righteousness when we come to him. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 21. And so we understand here then that we cannot be righteous unless we come to God and receive the righteousness. A look at chapter 4. Again, how he corrects the works righteousness mentality. Verse 4. Now to the one who works, or to the one who is working for his righteousness, that's the context here. He's lifting up Abraham as an example. The one who works for his righteousness... It doesn't work (laughs) because his wages are not counted as a gift but as his due. But we know that nothing we do can give us the righteousness of God. And so it's to the one, verse 5, who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly by faith is counted as righteousness. And so it is the person who says, I cannot work my way to heaven. I cannot work my way to God. And so I repent of that mentality and I rest in Jesus who is my Lord and is my Savior and who gives me his righteousness. So to repent means to turn away from yourself to Christ. We do this by turning away from faith in our goodness and family religion, and we do this by turning away from faith in our works of righteousness and resting in the works of Christ alone. Make sense? All right. So faith, what is faith again? Faith is two-sided coin, repent and believe. Repent and believe. So now let's think about what does it mean to believe? As repent means to turn, believe means to trust. Believe means to embrace Christ by faith. And again, that, that is the simplicity of a childlike faith that says, I know I'm a sinner, I cannot change myself, and I come to Jesus, and I plead with him to save me. And no matter how old we are, it's that childlike faith that Jesus wants from us. That's the childlike faith that saves. But childlike faith is not, to re, is not to be childish. And that's why I'm spent spending six weeks on this. Because God forbid that though he loves us to come to him with childlike faith and he accepts us just as we are, he does not, once we come to know him, he does not want us to stay the way we are. He wants us to grow up in Christ, to mature in him. 
But all of that growth and maturity is built on the foundation of the gospel. All of the commands that we are given by God in Scripture are built upon the work of Christ that he has already accomplished for us. None of those commands are, uh, can be obeyed by us without the life of God within us through saving faith, through the gospel, through the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, all we've done is traded our religion that we were raised in for a new religion. It just has a little different lingo, but it's basically the same thing. I'm just still doing it. No. If you think you're still doing it, then there's one word you don't understand, and that is done. It's already done by Jesus. And now you need to trust him that his word is true. So what does it mean to believe, to trust, to embrace? Well, let's look at three truths. First, it means to embrace Christ as the risen Lord who alone can save you from your sin. You know that you can't save yourself. You've tried. You know that you can't become righteous in your own strength. You've tried. And so you come to Jesus as the risen Lord who alone can save you. We're still in chapter 4. Um, I'm in verse 20, so if, if you're not there, then turn whatever pages you have to turn or scroll whatever you have to scroll. Chapter 4, verse 20, no unbelief, he's still talking about Abraham, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced, this is, this is faith, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He believed the promise of God. We have a lot more revelation than Abraham had, but in the simple faith of a man who trusted in the promise of God to someday send a Savior, to send a Redeemer, God looked at his faith and counted it as righteousness and imputed the righteousness of God to Abraham's account. And that's why verse 23 says, it was counted to him this righteousness was counted to him. And this righteousness came and comes to those who, verse 24, believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Christ is the risen Lord who alone can save us. Are you embracing Jesus that way? From your heart with faith are you are you at that place where you have come to God and recognized you have no righteousness of your own to ever offer to God either before you came to know Jesus or even after even for those of you who are believers you don't even you can't even manufacture enough righteousness now and I know that because I can't do that for myself, and I'm cut out of the same Adam and Eve fabric that you are cut out of. What else, what else does it mean? It means also to embrace Christ as the loving Savior who fully paid your sin debt when he died in your place. Look at chapter 5. So not only is he the risen Lord, but he's the loving Savior. He is the loving Savior who died in your place. Verse 8 of chapter 5, But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. What is it that motivated God to send Jesus 
to save us from our sin. It was his love. It was not our loveliness. It was not our lovability, our lovableness. It wasn't, oh, God just saw such amazing potential in us and he just had to save us because he couldn't possibly think of heaven without us. It was God's love. Pure, the purest, the purest love that we can't even imagine is the motive of God in saving us. And the purest love of all in Jesus moved him to say to the Father, I will do your will. And he knew what that meant as he sweat drops of blood in the garden that he would go to the cross and he would die in our place. He would be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. Are you embracing Jesus this way as your loving Savior who died in your place? understanding that you should have been the one to hang upon that cross. I should have been the one to hang upon that cross. But Jesus did it in our place. And then thirdly, to embrace means to embrace Christ as the giver of eternal life. To trust Christ means to embrace him as the giver of eternal life. Look at chapter 5. We've touched on this already, I know. So, but I want to, again, just stress to you how, how all these pieces just fit to, together so beautifully. But the free gift, verse 15, again, this is a contrast between Adam and Jesus, the second Adam. Adam brought sin into the world, which led to judgment which led to condemnation, which leads to eternal death. But God sent Jesus, the second Adam, into the world. Jesus brings not sin into the world, but righteousness. And the righteousness goes to everyone who believes, and everyone who believes then is justified, not condemned. Verse 15, but the free gift is not like the trespass. The free gift Jesus brought is not like the sin that Adam brought. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. We who are trusting in Christ, we who are embracing him in this way, we will one day reign in life through him. And this life is defined in verse 21 as eternal life. Everlasting life. We will reign through righteousness. Not our own righteousness. We will reign in the righteousness of Jesus who purchased this eternal life for us. See how important it is then when we understand eternal life as a gift that that then, to, to understand that means first we have to understand that no works of righteousness that we can do can save us. There are no wages. There are no righteous wages that we can deserve all we deserve is eternal punishment away from God forever we deserve nothing more but in the abundance of God's grace to us in Christ he has given us everything 
abundant life here and now, eternal life in the future. This is what it means to trust in Christ. And so again, as we visually think about this, we see it is Jesus Christ, the Lord and the Savior, who makes the one and only way to God. And how do we respond? How are we as sinners required by God to respond? To repent and to believe. To turn away from unbelief. To turn away from self-righteousness. To turn away from works righteousness. And believe in the one who did all of the necessary work already for us on that bloody cross proving it in his empty tomb. But just because God has done all this great work for us, just because Jesus has already paid the complete price for our sin does not mean we are automatically saved. We must respond to the gospel. God commands us to believe in his Son. And the one who believes in his son transfers from death to life. Now, the Apostle Paul could write so richly about the gospel in this way because of his own conversion. Let's just look briefly at the conversion of Paul. I'm in Philippians 3, and I want you to listen to Paul say what he's been saying to us in Romans, but to say it in the first person by sharing with us his own transfer from death to life, his own transfer from self-confidence in his own righteousness to confidence in the righteousness of Jesus. I'm in Philippians chapter 3. He tells us to rejoice in verse 1. He tells us to watch out for the dogs, which are false teachers who uh, always distort the gospel. But then in verse 3, notice how Paul describes his previous confidence in his family heritage and religious upbringing. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. That's what believers in Christ are called. But that's not the way it always was for me, Paul says. For though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. And here he's giving us his spiritual religious resume. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was of the people of Israel. I was born into the tribe of Abraham. If there ever was a Jew, I was the epitome. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And when it came to keeping the Old Testament law, I was a Pharisee. And as to zeal, well, I persecuted anything that did not propagate my religion. And so I persecuted the church I persecuted those who preached the true gospel and as to the righteousness under the law I was blameless but he who was trusting in his upbringing his religion he counted it loss for the sake of Christ that's repentance Whatever I had, I counted it as loss. I laid aside my confidence in myself and I placed my confidence in Jesus. And now he goes on to tell us how he turned away from faith in his works of righteousness. Verse 6, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I was I was blameless. As to righteousness, but I counted that as loss as well. Not only my religious upbringing, not only my heritage, 
but all of my works of righteousness, I also counted those as loss. Why? Because verse 8, he turned away from religion to a relationship. Indeed, verse 8, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. This is what repentance looks like. When you come to the cross, you lay all of your religious works at the foot of the cross and you say they have zero value. All value is in Christ. My works of righteousness can accomplish nothing. And then look at how he tells us how he embraced Christ as the only source of true righteousness and may be found in him, verse 9. Look at this, this is so important. Underline this in your Bible. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Not having a righteousness of my own achieved through my religion. But that which comes through faith in Christ, not through works, but in f through faith in Christ. And what is this righteousness? It is the righteousness that comes from God, and it depends on faith and faith alone. But here, as we saw in Romans, we see here in Paul's own testimony, what he meant by faith is he had to come to that place whereby he turned away from faith in himself and turned to Christ. And so I ask you this morning, where is your faith? Is it in yourself? Is it in you making a decision in the past? And that's what you go back to all the time. Well, I know on this day, this, this is what I did. Or are you looking to Christ? Do you have faith in your faith? Or do you have faith in Christ? Now, there's nothing wrong with being able to look back and remember the day that you came to Christ. I don't remember that day. I can only give you about a three-month period and the early months of 1984, when I know God began a good work in me and I began to see fundamental core change at the level of my heart. But what I am saying is this. Don't have faith in your faith because your faith is sometimes going to fail you. You are sometimes going to doubt you are sometimes going to walk through valleys of doubt and despair that are like are described in the book of Psalms. I've gone through some of those valleys and the only thing that kept me going was clinging to the one, holding to the one who I know was holding tighter to me than I was to him. Who are you looking to? Do you need to repent this morning of trust in yourself? Is it time to turn away from faith in yourself to faith in Christ? I don't know where you're at. The Holy Spirit knows, and he'll do a much better job applying this to you than I can. But I must exhort you in this way because you are part of my flock, and I love you. And Jesus loves you even more. And I want you to have the security that he says we can have when we look to him and him alone. God, we pray, do a wonderful work of grace in our hearts. Lord, if any of us really need to turn to you in this way for the first time today, oh, may the devil not hold them back. Oh, may they just in childlike faith trust in Jesus this way. 
if we've already known Jesus for a while, whether it's a week or 60 years, we still need to grow in our appreciation for the gospel, for what Jesus, Jesus did for us. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, do a work in our hearts through the good news that we have heard. Through the word of God, would you do your transforming work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.